All right, I want to do things slightly different than what the new subscribers have become used to me doing. And I want to break this into two parts, uh, partially because it'll be easier for you to actually implement what I'm saying, what I'm sharing, what I'm gifting versus just kind of listening, falling into, oh, yeah, I know I'm, I'm, I've tried that before. I need to do more of that and all the other chatter that we have in our heads, especially that dangerous sentence of I already know. And I am definitely guilty of saying the same thing, even though I know it's very dangerous because there is a reality that we know a whole lot. And in this age of the 21st century, there are so many quick ways to get access to information, but inf information without implementation is really not that helpful or supportive. And even more helpful is not just taking a bunch of information and applying everything, but trusting your inner brilliance for what is going to work with you, your style, your energy, your belief systems, and your overall aligned goals, whatever it is that you are choosing to do in this world. That is really important. So I want to take a step back and look at this part one of kind of setting the scales to no regrets in two main parts, because the high level, I want you to have no regrets as you live the balance of your days and years, hopefully 50 plus more years to come and whatever that looks like for a high quality life for you. But let's break it down into two parts. What does setting the scales to no regrets look like? If you are an entrepreneur, a founder, a high ambitious, high achieving, high performing um, leader of any kind in any type of organization or system, then you probably have a challenge with at least consistently balancing your ambition with your personal well-being. And that is something that for so many reasons is super important to me. And I don't know you, but it's super important to me as a clinician, as a trauma specialist, as a relationship expert, all of those various hats and so many more that I wear under the umbrella of balance and relationship advisor that I don't run into you when you are not at your best self. We are people. We are social creatures. We need people in every single different position out here. And I don't want to run into the version of you that is stressed that has high adrenal fatigue, that is dealing with unnecessary illness because it's stress induced. I don't want to, I don't want to run into you supporting me in my business, supporting me in my personal life, supporting me as a grandparent with my grandbabies that I want to be well taken care of or my children or anything in between. If I ever have the privilege of running into you, I want to make sure that it's the highest version of yourself because you were able to take a little bit of this information, filter it through your brilliance, what matters for you, what resonates for you, what's a stretch and a challenge, all by awkward for you that is really going to take you to your next level of evolution and expansion. And that version of you is who I want to run into selfishly, okay, selfishly all day. With that said, when we look at balancing our ambition and our well-being, we can look at it through the eyes of hustle culture, which is not what I'm here for. This is a haven away from the hustle and grind and all of those myths of how you have to be teen no sleep when you work, especially when you are trying to thrive in your business or your career. I want to look through it through the eyes of the lazy overachiever, which is just to bring some of your newbies back to the kind of redefined version of lazy, it's you honoring your need for rest and relaxation, recalibration, because you might need to recalibrate from whatever the year previously had in store for you or the years or the generational trauma or the breakups and the betrayal or the constant influx of toxicity that was going on in various ways in your life and in your work and in your community, and in your family, and all those other things. And then you might need to recharge. For me, that's what embracing a little bit more of that laziness is, is honoring that that is just as important, that rest, relaxation, recalibration, recharge, all the R's, all the re's, the, the, the reset, <laughs> all the re's is so important. And in fact, it's just as important as your need to be ambitious, to overachieve, to be highly accomplished, to dominate that sprint for that project that you're working on or that ladder that you're climbing, whatever it is, that is very important for your legacy, for your multi-generational imprint is what we like to say here at ThinkPro. 
All of that is fantastic. Mwah. Chef's kiss. And in parentheses, you matter. You are important. You are necessary. It is important on every single level that you honor the one thing that if it goes south, you can't get back. And if you do, it's a long, hard, likely unnecessary crawl to get to that version of you where you feel really good and confident in your body and your mind, your cognition, all the things. So diving right in and making this as potent and succinct as possible, because if you've been following me over at the Balanced Bully Podcast or any of the other interviews and things that I do, you know I am very verbal. I am not a woman who fails to have words. So I'm trying to rein it in here so you can really have spaciousness, which is what being intentionally selfish is, is making sure you have that space to give yourself the gift of joy your way. I want you to have that spaciousness you need to actually filter and implement whatever part of this resonates with your spirit. Okay. So first for me is something I have to laugh at kind of in my mind and out loud. My kids think who are 27 and 23, by the way, they think my favorite word is no, not true. My favorite word is boundaries. And that is the first step to balancing your ambition with your personal well-being is you have to set boundaries. Now, I know we hear that a lot. It's like the precious B word that everyone on every internet surface is talking about in some way, shape or form, but no one is really talking about how besides the the various ways that I've talked about it for sure and the, the various platforms that I've used to do it. When we think about boundaries, when I think about boundaries as a balance and relationship advisor, I'm thinking about it from its most expansive version of itself. So I literally call them expansive boundaries. I used to call them liberated boundaries because it liberates you, allows you to have freedom, but it wasn't far enough. I had to go a little bit further and it actually came from many, many moons ago. I was being interviewed by these two sisters and they used the word expansive when they were reframing what I said. And I was like, oh, I love that expansive boundaries. So it's kind of sitting and it's right there for me. And it's a huge part of what I talk about. Expansive boundaries look like if you're visual, if you can picture a huge estate, uh, a mansion, a, a big home with, let's say, at least 10 or 15 acres around it. And on the outside of those acres, like most big homes, estates or mansions, whatever you want to consider it in your visualization, there's a gate that's out there. Your boundaries are not the gate. It is very much something that's just built into our nature and our community. Your gate is more of your surface level trust, right? If you had to put your trust into a visual, something tangible, your trust is probably the gate. For the most part, you're not letting too many people pass the gate because of whatever your history has been with trusting, with being uh, betrayed in trust, with having people that you could trust very intimately and them do well by you. But that's typically what that gate is. It's representing overall very high level, surface level trust. And then we let people in the gate as we start to create, um, I'll say milestones is kind of such a business word, but I'm just going to use it. So roll with it as we kind of create milestones or stepping stones of what we would appreciate in any relationship, personal, professional, romantic, you know, whatever it is, parenting, whatever the relationship is, there are certain things that we expect. We expect to be treated kindly. We expect for people to be respectful. We expect for people to give us what we believe that we are giving them. Most of us, assuming that you're not having a low level day, where your vibrations are super low, where your rest is in the toilet, where your nervous system is all over the place, where you need to be recalibrated and you're not the kindest version of yourself. Let's assume that that's not the person who shows up in those relationships. Assume that you are a well-rested or at least halfway rested version of yourself. So you have some fuel, you have some energy, you can cognitively think through problems, you can hear people fully, you can actively listen, you can be present without feeling like you need to multitask every minute of the day. Let's assume that this is the version of you. And then you have a colleague who wants to get to know you a little bit. I offer, just an offer, that in order for you to have a good boundary with this new colleague, with this long-term colleague, with this new person that you're interested in building a friendship with, maybe a, a business bestie, you know, whatever it is that in the back of your mind you might be tinkering with. 
that you dance before you date. Don't just let them through the gate and all of a sudden they're in your house, up in your kitchen, going through your drawers, going in the refrigerator. Like, let's not do that. Dancing can look in so many different ways, depending on your rhythm, your style, you know, how many songs it takes you to work up a sweat, to get into flow. Just think of it that way. And let's also assume that dancing isn't uh, your job <laughs> because then you can hit the floor and you go. And if you use that in this analogy or this metaphor, it will be challenging because you'll have way too many people on the inside of your gate of your estate than you really, really, truly should. So let's just assume you are a normal person with normal rhythm, um, with normal interest in music. And normal is not necessary, guys. I say that all the time. But in this case, work with with the analogy. So you want to dance with them and you say, okay, let's have, let's, let me take you through the gate. If you feel comfortable, because your discernment, your ability to trust your inner brilliance is telling you this person can come into the gate. Mind you, we have 10 plus acres around our state. They're way away. Your gate is way far away from your actual home of your heart, your mansion, your estate, whatever you want to call it. So there's plenty of space to say, let me dance with you up. Don't like it. Let me put you back on the other side of the gate. No problem, right? That's a a whole different issue when we talk about having to give people eviction notices because they're in a part of our estate that we feel is violating or they've been there too long or they've taken up space and they're not in reciprocity with us. That's a whole different episode, if you will. And please, by all means, let me know below or email me or DM me at asknikita at thigpro.com whether or not you want more information on how to give eviction notices. But for now, let's focus on here. So we're dancing, which looks like, hey, would you like to sit and have coffee or tea or water or whatever? Have a 15 to 20 minute conversation with someone to get to know them as a person. Yes, if you're if it's a professional relationship, you're probably going to talk a little about a work, a little bit of work. But let's not hide behind work, which I see a lot, like with the power couples and potent humans, which is my definition of amazing women founders, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial leaders. Many times they'll just want to talk about work because work is easy to hide behind. Right. We could talk about work all day because we can project you know, what's going on with other people that might be a reflection of really what's going on on the inside of us, but we can put a name to it. We can put a company to it. We could put a project to it. We could put a insult with a vendor or some other miscommunication to it that's outside of us. But when we have to be introspective and go in, that's a little bit harder. So you just met this person. They don't owe you nothing. You don't owe them nothing. Maybe you do talk about a little bit more surface and your first dance with them. That's in the parking lot. You're dancing in the parking lot. So parking lot people might be there for a little while, right? But it, there's no particular time frame. They might just be really good conversationalists, people that you are interested in, that every once in a while, there's something that comes up for you in your mind. Like, oh, I could help this person with this by referring them, connecting them, um, introducing them, right? Like all those little things. Parking lot people fantastic humans. We want and we need parking lot people. They are important. Even if you're an introvert and you prefer to just run into your estate and close the door and never have to talk to anyone, parking lot people are good. They give us a little bit of that social energy that makes us feel connected to the global consciousness. Just a little bit of what's going on in the world. It could be two people in your parking lot. It could be 500 in your parking lot. Doesn't matter. It's whatever you feel is your capacity for those kind of intermittent, barely below surface conversations. Now, if you are someone like me, this is not a judgment, just a statement that isn't really interested in surface level conversations because my purpose, my role, uh, which is also anchored into my business, much of what I do is in conversations. So I'm really not interested in how's the weather, uh, what's going on with your cat, dog, or frog. Um, Dog is a little bit unfair because I am a big dog lover. So I'm probably really am interested in your dog. But that aside, (laughs) I'm probably going to want to go a lot deeper and respect that you are not interested. You don't know me well enough. You know, this is not an interview. This is not where you want to go. So there's a way to kind of handle that side of you by making sure you have deeper, intimate relationships on the inside, inside of your seat. So setting a boundary with yourself around how you even allow people 
access to you is the first thing that I would recommend for balancing your ambition with your personal well-being because people can drain us. That's not always their intention. That's not necessarily what we want to look at them for, like, oh, a human attaching, taking my energy, leeching. You may have some people like that in your circle or around you, work, personal play. That's something that you'll have to be honest with yourself with, trust your inner brilliance. Who are these people? What am I giving to the relationship? How can I give a little bit more? How can I take some of my power back? All these things are essential in deciding whether or not you want to dance with them to the first step of your estate. If you want to dance with them into your, remember, this is an estate, not just a traditional kind of small home. You have an atrium. So you have another way to filter, another way to have a boundary. Okay, great. This is a professional colleague that I met in another state. We had a great time. We're staying connected and you really want to stay connected and you feel like it's deeper than parking lot conversation. Great. Bring them into your atrium. Remember, you have a huge estate. Want to go deeper, want to learn more about their family, want to show up at graduation parties and birthday parties for kids, want your kids to play together. If you are at that stage in life where you have children and all those different things, great. They're probably going to move into the living room of your estate and we go deeper and deeper until we get to the kitchen. Now, no one's going upstairs except for your really intimate people, which can include some of those kitchen table people, but is likely not all of them. And not because you don't feel comfortable and you don't trust them because your kitchen table people, you really do trust. You will tell them what's in your bank account if they really truly needed to know for something, not just to be nosy, but if they really wanted to know, you would open up because there is a mutual reciprocal trust that is there. And the people who are at your kitchen table, you should be at their kitchen table. Because if you are not, there is someone at their kitchen table that they are talking about your kitchen table business with. So be really, really mindful of that on so many different levels. Also look at whether or not you want to stay at their kitchen table. If you feel like I'm definitely at theirs, they give me a lot of information. They've been very open. They seem to be consistent across platforms and situations where they're not acting funny when we're around certain people and, you know, acting all clingy or wanting to be near me and other when if that's not the case and you really feel like I am at their kitchen table and I feel really good and comfortable, but there's a part of me that is resisting having them at my kitchen table, really reassess with yourself why that is. Is there something in your in your intuition that is telling you this person isn't as safe as you would want them to be? You really want to see the full potential. You want to see the loyalty. You want to see the reciprocity you really want to, but if you were to be honest with yourself, it's not really there. It's you kind of being the person that's always reaching out. That's the only time you talk to them unless they need something. When they do call, there's a transaction. When you call, you're really checking in. Most of the time you're calling, like really look at what those relationships are for the people who you're definitely, from what you can ascertain, sit at their table but you're not really sure they truly belong at yours. Maybe you felt like you had to have them sit at yours. So these are all part of the setting of the boundaries, which is really important. I even wrote some notes because I wanted to be sure to stay on task. Um, Yes, so setting the boundaries with that. There's multiple boundaries, but I just wanted to give a teaser for that. That one is your energy management boundary, like being really, really mindful about your energy management capacity and your ability to close the leaks around you in your relationships. Being able to say a full yes or a full no is another area of boundary, but it's not just regulated to boundaries. It's an important power move for you to be able to to make. So for me personally, I talk about something that I do in business where it's a three check, IAC. Am I interested in this thing? Is it aligned with my greater purpose, my long-term goals, all the things I want to do? And C, do I have capacity for it? Because I might be interested. Oh, I I really want to work with this person. Uh, I want to go to this event and have this experience. It is aligned with my greater purpose, my long-term goals to create these multi-generational imprints by building these stronger families who have self-actualized their own wholeness so they're no longer passing through toxic, traumatic experiences to the generations to come, right? Long-term goal, just me personally in my little bubble. 
And maybe this thing is both interesting and aligned with that for my long-term goal. But if I don't have capacity, because I have something which brings me into another element of how you can balance your ambition with your personal well-being, if I have something critical or urgent that is on my list of things that has to get done for me to feel complete with whatever that project or issue or challenge is, for me to feel confident about the fact that I was able to complete something that was critical or urgent to me and or my business and or my family, or is simply in alignment with me as a person, like a healing nap. So I have a rare autoimmune and it's really important for me to make sure I super check in. I do body scans daily, sometimes five times a day, depending on what's happening. Where is their inflammation? Where is their stress? Where if where do I feel dysregulated? Where is there an ache or pain that I've just been ignoring and minimizing it, as many of us do, to say, oh, it's just a little malaise. Oh, it's just, it's just, it's just. Where am I doing the just is just and not really giving full attention before something blossoms into, you know, something more inconvenient, to, to put it politely. So doing those body scans and all those things sounds like, oh, that's just an important thing or maybe a to-do. It's not. For me, it's critical. So you have to know yourself really well, be willing to be intimate with yourself, to know yourself really well in order for you to honestly answer that last part of IAC, Interested Aligned Capacity, that's the C, to really be honest with you around, do I actually have capacity? Am I rested? which is critical for me, maybe it's, there's critical, urgent, important. Maybe it's just important for you, but it's critical for me. Do I have um, enough uh, hip mobility to feel really good about walking without aches and pains or, you know, whatever that registers as my normal versus unusual, but it's become normal and unnecessary versus optimal. And I want to live optimally. So I'm constantly looking at better ways to do it, but giving myself some time to see is the one way that I'm working on for the next three months or so. Is it working? If it's not, not a bad thing. I'm still moving at that like 0.01% in the right direction, which to the earlier point, when I started this conversation with you, when you are, when you say things like I already know, you're not accounting for the 0.01% of growth that can just come from doing something you already know, implementing it consistently, even though you've known it for years, or maybe implementing consistently with a better mindset around it. Because that's a thing, guys. If you are someone who's like, oh, I don't have time for the woo-woo. I don't want to hear anything about, you know, positive affirmations or mindset or reframing. Then I ask you to go into a deep dive on neuroscience and neurobiology and look at how much your mind matters for your body. The way you think, the way that you talk, the words that you use, what you ruminate on quietly when no one outside of your person can hear you, what you say to yourself while you're brushing your teeth, what you say to yourself while you're getting in the shower or washing up, what you say to yourself when you're simply laying out your clothes, or if you happen to be a woman that wears a little lipstick, when you're outlining your lips, like the things that we say to ourselves actually do matter for our entire body. And obviously anything that's going on your body will energetically leak, good or not so good, into your environment onto your children, onto your forever lover, onto your parents, if if you are in proximity to them, into your friendships, into your other relationships, into your creativity or not, into your logical ability to process or not, it leaks. So you want to be mindful that what you're leaking is the good stuff. It's I'm leaking righteous energy of enlightenment and positivity and love and peace and laughter and fun and silliness, as well as serious contemplation and uh, leaking interpersonal skill adaptation because I'm showing you what I'm doing and not just talking about it. That's hard to do if your mind isn't in alignment with where you could be because you don't really have capacity, yet you keep saying yes to things that aren't truly in the right vibration with you. I was trying to think of the words that I wanted to say. And that's really important. Um, And again, 
if you're interested and it's aligned, those are great things, but you still got to have capacity. Because if you don't, maybe it's just a let me defer that. It's not necessarily a delete. I delete the things that aren't in alignment for sure. I consider deleting the things that I'm not completely interested in. And the only reason that that's a consideration is because sometimes you're not interested in the thing that's the most uncomfortable or the thing that's really awkward. You have to assess with your inner brilliance, with your intuition, with your discernment. Those are all three in one. Am am I not interested because I'm afraid? Am I afraid to do this thing? Am I scared of rejection, of doing this thing and it not being received well? Am I afraid that if I do this thing that reminds me of this other thing that I did that really shot my confidence or really took me off my path or really, 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 right? Like all the questions that come up, you should filter that to just triple check that the question around interested isn't being knocked out of the park because you're unnerved because you're afraid, because you feel awkward about it. One of my favorite things in the world is to get awkward with people. And of course, it's in a fun, loving, helpful, healing way, but it's also to be a pattern disruptor, right? Like let's disrupt the pattern of what you expect. If I'm a keynote in your organization and I'm coming in, guaranteed, if you have ever seen me, you know that I do a lot of pattern disrupt. And part of it is not coming from like, oh, I came specifically to do this thing. I listen. I try to get to events hours, if not days before I have to speak. And I try my best whenever humanly possible based on our schedule, our business, our family, critical and urgent, you know, important things that are in the higher priority to really show up fully so I can listen. And I typically don't wear the speaker's badge I I love to like surprise people when I get there, mainly because when people know what your label is, um, what your title is, if you're a part of programming, they definitely treat you a certain way. They talk to you a certain way. They limit certain things or they give you certain things that they wouldn't had they known that you were the keynote or you were a major, you know, signature presentation or anything like that. So I try not to whenever humanly possible without disrupting what the the host or organizer wants. And part of that is so I can listen. So I participate like everyone else. I'm honest about my answers. Oh, what brought you here? Oh, so-and-so referred me. So-and-so connected me. I've been talking to so-and-so for a while, like whatever. So it's not like I'm incognito in a way that I can't build authentic relationships. I'm just not saying what my role in that particular performance for over the two or three days or whatever it is for that retreat or that conference or association event is. And what I love the most is people, not only are they surprised when I go up like, oh my God, I was sitting with her or she was at my table when we were doing rotating tables or whatever, is because I'm able to pull in things that I observed in a very natural and organic way and use that as a part of the pattern interrupt, which is super important. Otherwise, people aren't listening to tuning out. They're on their phone. You already know because you're overachieving. So you've been in rooms where you came to serve and give and, and do and people were in a whole nother mood and you had to do a lot of energy to pull them into the space. So one of the things that has been helpful is me knowing my capacity and all the things that are made me show up with a full yes so I can be in integrity to that, but also being in a space where I can listen because I made room for it, that it's kind of tiptoeing into our next episode that we'll get into over the quality over quantity, but it's a huge part of what makes me successful in what I do and how I do it. So um, I just want to leave you um, just going in my head with a couple of things that I wanted to make sure we got to for balancing your ambition with personal well-being is obviously expansive boundaries and having them so that you can you know, leak good stuff because it's not really leaking. You're really allowing the good stuff and you not leak anything that still needs to be recalibrated or adjusted through the filter of rest and relaxation and, and recharge and all the things. Making sure that you prioritize what is critical, urgent, and important is super, it's crucial, right? Like I don't want to use another C, but that's what's coming up. It's very crucial to do so. A quick tidbit of how to do that is I like to, because I'm visual, I like to look at things in a very tangible way, even though I'm very esoteric and mystical in all the other ways that if you knew me personally, you would know to be true. When I think of things critical, I think of if this doesn't happen, the house is on fire. 
the estate is on fire, the business is on fire, the so-and-so is on fire. Like this is critical. This must get done. There is no if, and, or but about it. The way we do it can can change, but it must get done, right? Like it has to get done. So I feel that way very much, very powerfully around our mission. We are building stronger families to create those new multi-generational imprints from their own self-actualized wholeness. In short, we're breaking generational curses and, in parentheses, we're creating new imprints in those genetics through all of the great things that are happening because these people are more whole, they're healthy, they're healed, they have a new mindset, a new mind frame, they reframe things that they would have just let fall out of their mouths, they're thinking about their energy different, they're moving differently, their neurobiology and the neuroscience of their cognition, everything is aligning in a much more peaceful way. Life is still lifing, storms are still hitting, but their approach to handling it is a, a more peaceful, more bounty for, more transcendent way to do it. So their kids have better emotional regulation. So their neighbors have better emotional regulation around them just by the allowed energy that flows. Because I want to take back that word leak that I use for both the positive and negative. The leak feels a little bit more negative. The allowing is more purposeful. And that's what I want to do high level. So that is critical for me. So I, no matter what programs or VIP days or um, incubators, certifications, courses, it doesn't matter. Whatever I do is anchored to that goal because it's critical for me. The house is on fire if we don't always aim for that goal, right? And that you can align that with like specific projects. What part of this project is critical, must be done, or houses on fire, businesses on fire, organizations on fire, relationships on fire, that kind of thing. Urgent is more of a, <clears throat> I left something plugged in that turns red, like the iron or curling iron, um, you know, toasters, all the things that we know for fire prevention, you should not leave plugged in because there could be a current that comes through. Now, it's not critical because it's not a guaranteed house will be on fire. Many of us have left the toaster plugged in and nothing happened, right? But it is technically a possibility of something zapping through that current. If it's an iron and you left it plugged in, even if you left it off, there's still an, an opportunity for something to come through. The iron falls over, whatever, right? So that's urgent. That is a, I really have to pay attention to this before it becomes critical. I have to look at how to shape this, how to do this, who I need to pull in as resource partners, power partners, referral partners, whatever, to really help this thing go in the right direction so it doesn't become critical, right? So critical, house on fire, urgent, be really wary, got to check that, got to do whatever I need to do to unplug things so nothing goes on fire. And then important is more like the batteries need to be checked in the various things, your... Um, your carbon monoxide detector, you need to check that. Very important, right? Like it's important. It doesn't necessarily mean it's critical if you know that I mean, pretty much I change them twice a year, like I should be good, but it's important. It's something that you don't want to not do and not do in a timely manner, but you might be able to push it a week or two. So that's something that, or you can even delegate that. The important stuff you definitely should be delegating as much of the important stuff as you can, because then it opens you more up and gives you more spaciousness to focus on the critical and even the urgent. And if you have the resources, by all means, delegate and outsource the urgent ports, parts as well, which again, I'll circle back in a part two, but I wanted to make sure that I gave you guys that. Um, and of course, the most important, which I think I've said multiple ways, but I'll say it again, is you want to infuse balance by making some actual dedicated space. So for me, that looks like permission to pause breaks throughout the week, which could be 20 minutes um, on a Monday that gives me a little bit of an elongated lunch period. Or maybe I shorten my, my day by a half an hour because that's important for me to really like conserve my energy, especially Usually midweek is very full for us just because of other people's schedules and how it works. So Mondays, I try to keep light on my scheduling time, light on my connection time, really only critical and urgent meetings for the most part get on Mondays because that's more of a preparing for the week um, 
a more on the business versus in the business attitude that I have on a Mondays as a business owner for 13 years. Uh, and that's it's different for everyone, but that's how I like to keep my Mondays away for me to infuse breaks. But I have them scheduled on my Monday where Tuesday through Thursday swing with heaviness and heat on it. So that m- might look like two minute breaks where I'm just blowing bubbles. I wish I had some out. I do. <laughs> I might blow some bubbles and blowing bubbles sounds silly. It is. It brings me back into a spirit of childhood, which nostalgia is so good for your brain. It's so good for your body. So much nerding out that I could do about that, but let's just keep it G. Blow some bubbles. You're doing the deep breathing. You're having a little fun. Hopefully you get a laugh or two out of it. Somewhere between two and three minutes is all you need. You've just massaged your inner organs. You've done a lot of stuff in two minutes of blowing bubbles. It's a really good thing. And I keep, actually keep quite a few of them with me and I give them to friends and family too. Um, Blow some bubbles, have fun, tap into your inner five-year-old, right? And that might be the only thing I can do on those really, really full days besides hydrating, keeping myself, uh, you know, nourished with snacks. Uh, My youngest, who's 23, teases all the time. She's like, all you eat is berries and carrots and (laughs) and nuts and things. Like I actually eat more than that. But when I'm having really full days, I just need a little protein, a little nourishment, a little energy coming from some really good complex carbs to come my way so I can keep the beat and not in my day so exhausted that now I don't have energy to cook dinner. I don't have energy to talk to my forever lover and souls have. I don't have energy to be attentive when my 23-year-old wants to share how her day at work went or whatever the case is, or our grandbabies who both have ASD might need a little extra attention, even more than toddlers would typically need to make sure that they're learning and growing sufficiently with their specific way that their brain works. And our youngest grandson also has sickle cell disease. So there's a lot of things that are going in there in that pot that I need to have energy for and focus. And if I hammer myself at work on a regular basis, I'm not saying that I don't have those days where I'm like, "Woo, honey, I can't do anything else. But I try really hard to not make that a pattern, right? To, to not have too much of that going on. So just being really, really mindful of that with yourself. Um, So bubble breaks, deep breathing breaks. I like to breathe through straws when I do four, seven, eight, four, four seconds in, hold for seven, exhale out your mouth for eight and hold at the bottom of that exhale for a count of four. Do that five times. You've just literally reset your entire nervous system. The best thing. There's some additional polyvagal theory things that we could talk about, but start there. It's good stuff. I want you to implement. I want you to filter through your inner brilliance what needs to be implemented for you, but make sure you do that. We talked about delegation. The only thing we didn't talk about here, which I think I'll just go in a little bit more on part two, is the space to self reflect uh, and celebrate. You know, reflection is something that many of us do too much of because we reflect to the point that we're ruminating over it, perseverating over it, analysis paralysis can't move forward. I don't want you to reflect to the point that you go so backwards that you move all of your accomplishments into a space of disarray or where you don't even see them as accomplishments anymore because they were so long ago that you start to take for granted all the hard work that your former self knows that you did do and that you did put in. But it's easy to have that happen if you feel like there wasn't anything notable in a certain amount of time. If you didn't get an award in the last two years, if you didn't um, get a call out, a shout out, whatever that looks like these days online or offline in a certain amount of time, if you hadn't made a certain amount of money in a certain amount of time or had a stretch of, you know, six figure weeks or whatever the case is, that is your kind of like, hey, I used to be able to do this or I did that thing one time. And then you kind of disacknowledge it. I know I'd be making up words. It's an Akitaism, roll with it. But you disacknowledged it by saying, well, that was so long ago and you did it. You participated in it. You co-created it with whoever you were involved in that with. You did it at one point. It still matters. Even if it was one thing that you did, it still matters. And your life is proof that you can do hard things. So sometimes reminding yourself of that is really crucial. And that brings you to that swing of celebrating. Reflect, yes, 
reflect so you can pull the lessons out of things, the nuggets, the reminders, the ahas. Yes, reflects, reflects, and in parentheses, make sure you celebrate. This is all how you balance your ambition with your personal well being. You must celebrate. Celebrate that you woke up this morning. Celebrate that you have cognition of mind. Celebrate that you have mobility of limbs. Celebrate that you have breath in your body if you need to start there. I mean, I do that anyway, but if you're like, well, I don't have any big thing to celebrate, start small and micro stack it and then go bigger. Notice I started with the inside of my body. I bring everything back to the body because trauma lives in the body, but so does triumph, right? Like let's really (laughs) remind ourselves of that. So bring it back to the body and then go out, starting with all the things you are grateful for, all the things that you can think about in that moment to celebrate, even if it's just two or three, like I said, breath and body, mobility, limbs, cognition of mind, whatever, then go out. I'm celebrating that my kids made it to X age. I'm celebrating that I made it to X age with no kids. Hello. Like, you know, celebrate in whatever way that looks like for you and then go out into your professional accomplishments, you know, certifications, school projects that you completed that have nothing to do with a certification or degree at the end of it, but just things that you did that was really challenging when you worked on them and you completed them. Celebrate and then go out to those other external recognition, validation things like degrees that, you know, clearly you got the degree. So that was external validation that you completed something or a project that you won or an interview that you landed, whatever that is, go out that way. Because by the time you get there, your energy level is already going up. Your vibration is increasing. And not only are you building your own confidence, but you are literally balancing your ambition with personal well-being, which is step one to setting the scales to no regrets.